Recently, you may have seen the trend where TikTokers claim that their grocery produce is different. Well, I'm not sure if this is true or false. It's probably false. All of this actually follows concerns about one of the most underappreciated and overlooked things in this world dirt, or as the classy people call it, soil. Everything on this planet literally exists on top of it. But most importantly, we can't grow our produce without it. Now, being a true-blooded American, I've never eaten a vegetable in my life, but the produce they grow also provides food for our real food, such as pigs, cows, and chickens. Here in the Midwest where we are today, farmers produce over a quarter of the entire world's supply of corn and soybeans. In fact, 75% of the land here is dedicated to just those two crops in order to support the United States' demand for animal feed, biofuel, and export interests. Oh, and processed foods. Can't forget those. However, since poor farming practices have led to one of the greatest ecological disasters ever to happen to mankind in the 1930s, called the Dust Bowl, soil quality has been a tremendous topic of interest for the nation. Today, we're going to be investigating the soil quality in the Midwest from the fertile farms of Indiana to the urban sprawl of Chicago with the best tool to do so, our microscope. Paired with some data from the United States Department of Agriculture, we're going to find out how the Midwest turned from this into this and what makes these fields so agriculturally productive. When the great American Midwest is mentioned, you might think of things like Chicago deep dish pizza, football fanaticism, and near Canadian levels of friendliness. However, what likely gets mentioned the most is this farmland, seemingly endless miles of it, and the hardworking farmers that grow the food on it that we all rely on for our survival. 96% of these farms are actually family owned, and besides growing corn and soybeans, it also provides America with 25% of its wheat, 70% of its pork, and 40% of its beef, as well as many, many other agricultural products. And the reason that this has become prime farmland is because it used to look like this. If you watch my video about New Jersey, you'll know that these are wetlands and they contain extraordinary amounts of nutrients and are filled with microorganisms. However, they're clearly suboptimal for farming. So how did all of this land end up as the precursor for Doritos and diabetes? If we take a look at the soil survey by the US Department of Agriculture, which by the way is completely free to use, we can find an extraordinarily detailed map of all the different soils that make up this farmland. The two samples I collected are Hoytville Silty Clay and Guilford Sandy Loam. Both were formed when we drained the wetlands, but they're actually quite different from each other. Let's take a look at the Hoytville first, which I actually acquired in Ohio. As you can see, the soil has small particles of silt and clay. These are the remains of ancient glacial deposits that carved through this region and weathered down the rocks and sediments that later became flooded with rivers and floodplains. This is what characterizes the USDA's Hoytville series of soils. These soils used to be part of the Great Black Swamp, a swath of wetlands covering 1,500 acres across Indiana and Ohio. Obviously, it has been drastically transformed from its original habitat. After it was drained in the 19th century, it became some of the most productive farmlands in the world. You can see the sediment and organic matter left over from this terraforming. Draining the swamp not only allowed crops to take root, but also provides a suitable habitat for microorganisms like this nematode. Even more importantly, it is an excellent environment for beneficial fungi and bacteria that help support soil quality. These not only help break down complex organic matter into more usable plant nutrients, but form symbiotic relationships with plant roots. The plants provide carbohydrates from photosynthesis, and then the fungi and bacteria provide nutrients such as phosphorus, nitrogen, and minerals, reducing the need for chemical fertilizers. Now, let's take a look at the Guilford Sandy Loam that I acquired from Indiana. The first thing I noticed is the larger particle size, which results in a soil that is easier to drain, but less fertile. This is because it was formed from lake beds and floodplains, leading to larger sand deposits. This allows it to support a wider variety of crops, but requires more attention and care in order to maintain. It is still very productive and supports large amounts of bacteria and other microbes. I think it is amazing that these remnants from the Ice Age and ancient floodplains play such a major but hidden role in our lives. Dead organisms built up over hundreds, if not thousands of years, now support the soil ecosystems required to sustain modern life as we know it. Without it, who knows what America's infrastructure and agricultural landscape would look like. Food is essential to support and grow cities. The less people you need to feed others, the more freedom they have to build things like skyscrapers, create art, and call you about your car's extended warranty. But speaking of cities, now let's compare these to some soil that doesn't support soybeans, but instead billions and billions of tons of concrete and human beings. This is the great city of Chicago, Illinois, which I actually like a lot more than I expected. It's got incredible food, stunning beaches, and most importantly, terrible drivers. 
This area also used to be a wetland, and you can still see that there's a little bit left. However, most of it has been transformed into a concrete jungle for finance bros to cause the next global financial crisis. I took a sample of some of the remaining soil in Chicago, and as you can see, it can still clearly grow big trees like this one. But clearly, this little piece of land has been used and abused again and again by people's feet. Though I know some of you freaky people wouldn't mind that. This soil is classified by the USDA as simply urban land. And if we dive into this, we'll find not much. This is what soil can become if we don't take care of it. It has been heavily compacted with poor drainage, little organic matter, and is therefore suboptimal for supporting the microorganisms required for healthy soil. You can barely see any bacteria under phase contrast, and I didn't see a single microbe or fungi of any sort in any of the samples I looked at. Some of this particulate is also likely to be microplastics. The USDA states that these soils are most likely to have issues due to human activities leading to increased heavy metals, pesticides, and flooding. These make urban soils some of the lowest quality dirt that can be found. And I think there's a joke in there somewhere. It would take a significant amount of fertilizer and work to grow produce in anything like this. So I think it's no surprise that cities spend billions to maintain their landscaping, and even so, there are clearly still dead spots everywhere with little chance of revitalization. So why does any of this matter? Only 1% of Americans are farmers, meaning that a literal fraction of the population supports the other 99. And this number is only on the decline as more and more farmers decide to move to the city. Even more concerning is that the average age of a farmer in the United States is 58 years old and growing. This means there's gonna be tremendous losses in practical and generational farming knowledge. Even though we're developing new technologies and learning more about agriculture every single day, the traditional knowledge of biodiversity, weather patterns, and soil health is still incredibly important for ensuring the future of our food. Farmers that have been tilling the same fields for decades and decades have the deep experience necessary to understand how each and every single one of these tiny variables comes together to affect the crop yield for not just today, but for years in the future. Without that experience, we may lose the vital skills and knowledge necessary to maintain these lands that feed the country. So next time you drink a Coke, eat a steak, or God forbid, consume a salad, don't forget about all the tiny pieces that have to come together for the food to get to your table. From the combined centuries of human agricultural experience to the actual hands that do the work, no piece is too small. Thanks again for watching this episode of Not So Small. Let me know if there's anything else you'd like me to investigate and enjoy your meal.